Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the World Chess Championship match between Magnus Carlsen and Jan Nipponici. This is round number eight, but more importantly, today's my birthday. So thank you all for the well wishes so far on various social media platforms and in the comments of some recent videos. I've seen the comment section just absolutely flooded with that. So just want to say that it's a little bit more important than this massive uh, thing that we've got going on. But Magnus is up 4-3 to three after one decisive game two games ago. Let's see if he continues to apply the pressure with the white pieces uh, or if he's just going to kind of change his approach, be ultra solid uh, and uh, allow Jan to come to him. He goes back to E4. He goes back to E4 because... The World Chess Championship is, uh, is a battle of consistency. If it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of a situation. Uh, and we see a Petrov for that very reason. You know that your opponent's not going to randomly trot out something else. They're not going to play the Latvian Gambit. They're not going to play the Elephant Gambit. They're not going to play the Bond Cloud. If it work once, it's going to work again, right? Well, that's why Magnus deviates with the move D4. This is a pretty aggressive way uh, against uh, playing against the Petrov. In general, in any sort of e4, e5 position, uh, the move d4 is going to happen at some point. It happens in Rui Lopez later on down the line. Same thing in, um, uh, in the Italian game, sometimes in the Scotch. I mean, sometimes it happens as early as move 2. You try to go for various gambits. So the move d4 kind of creates a tension here between what's going to take what. Jan plays the, the main line, which is sort of the whole point of, you know, knight takes uh, on e4. Uh, there's all sorts of trick lines here. You can, like, put the queen here and try to try to do some stuff, but this is all garbage at the Super GM level, but totally uh, playable at lower levels. I mean, by all means, you know, like 98% of the, my audience is below the rating of 2,000, right? I mean, that's that's just the truth about the numbers of, of, of chess. So if you want to play all these queenie twos and Petrovs, and by all means, do it. Um, Bishop d3 is played, d5, and now knight takes e5. So both players have their knights in the middle. Jan plays the most uh, principled way, which is just trying to trade off white's knight. I mean, knight d7, absolutely reasonable move. Sometimes white castles here, but in general, all of white's plans involve the knight going to c3 at some point. The point is that, like, even if you take uh, and then you play, like, for example, uh, knight c3, uh, this structure is very, very solid for white. You can always play c4, and then you have backup. You have a new c pawn. You have rook b1, rook b1, and then you have just a slight, a very, very slight, you know, uh, kind of advantage of the fact that you get to move before black does. That's just like white gets to set their tone of the game first. So most of the play is generated around knight to c3. Here, Magnus plays a, a shocking move. Uh, he plays knight d2, which is played like in 0.001% oh, 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 of games. I mean, almost never played. Uh, the reason being that black can simply take, and I mean, this is not really challenging because you have not actually created any imbalance. There is no, I mean, it's just virtual symmetry, right? However, black here needs to actually be careful. Black cannot just go for complete symmetry like, like this. Uh, oops, sorry, I misclicked. Black cannot just do this, which is what Jan did. The best move for black, if you spend a little time, queen e7 check. In a lot of these positions where the queens are still able to give these straightaway checks, they're sort of good because the opponent now needs to react to the check. And uh, that's not always the easiest thing to do. Like, if you go queen e2, your advantage is gone. I mean, you're just trading all the pieces and... That's not really what we want, right? And and the best way for white to play is bishop to e3 to block this check. And then if black plays queen b4 and gets a little bit overzealous, uh, this is too much. White castles, I mean, this is a poison pawn. You haven't actually finished your development. Rook b1 is coming. I mean, black needs to actually be careful if black goes off venturing with the queen into the forest. Yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, you don't want to go exploring in the wilderness wearing, like, gold bracelet uh, and gold watch and gold chain. I don't, I, I don't know. Maybe you guys wear platinum. I don't know what kind of jewelry you guys like. Uh, but uh, after bishop e3, black should probably castle long or something, rather than going pawn hunting. Instead of that, total symmetry. Why is this bad? Well, apparently after castles, you would think that black wants to just castle themselves. But that's not possible. I mean, it's, it's going to lead to problems after the move queen to h5. Uh, that move threatens mate, and it also threatens this pawn, and you can actually defend both of those things by playing the move uh, f5. But after the move f5, white proceeds with natural play. Rook to uh, e1, uh, bishop to g5, uh, and uh, I mean, it, it, it's, just, it's just white who is better here. I mean, it's, it, it's, ju it's just white who is better. Like, that's, that's, that's the end of the evaluation. And so for that reason, Jan here after uh, White Castle spent 17 minutes, and it was clear, and, and immediately the world started buzzing about this, 
not like the whole world, like, you know, uh, Biden wasn't like doing a speech about it or something like that, but, um, or Trump. I, I'm gonna just be inclusive of former president because I know some of you, you know, y'all, y'all like who you like. I don't want to just name drop someone. You're like, what about it? Okay, relax before we get any crazy political people in the comments. Um, anyway, the chess world started buzzing about the fact that, um, you know, Jan messed up. He, he misplayed after bishop d6, and oh my god, this is such genius preparation for Magnus, a seemingly harmless position. Jan here thought for 17 minutes and played the move h5. h5. A total novelty. Never played over the board, never played in any engine database, and never played uh, in, uh, in, 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 you know, any chess website database that I was able to, to, to find. Never. This is the first time. Now, I saw some people saying that this is actually his prep and his 17 minute thought was a lie. He lied. He actually was going to always play this. He just decided to spend 17 minutes instead of playing his prep. That is fascinatingly stupid of a theory, but I love it. I mean, you know, I love it. Um, maybe it's true. And here, Magnus in turn uh, spent 41 minutes. Now, h5 is a really fascinating move because black is sort of saying that you can check me however you want. I'm most likely going to move my king to f8. For example, uh, something like rook e1 check, king to f8. Then my queen will come out over here. Uh, and uh, you, I mean, you, ju you just really, like, I I I'm going to create an attack, like, some, some way. Maybe g5. Maybe I'm going to play h4, and then my rook is going to come to h5. You know, maybe. Right now, the rook is sort of controlled on, on these squares. But that's sort of the idea in the future. Maybe queen f6, then you're going to bring this rook over here. And you're actually going to be the first one to create an attack, because it's white who committed their king. So... Uh, very interesting moment here. The best move according to engines, and it seems like all the super GMs analyzing the game kind of ultimately collectively decided, the best move is c4. Starting a, a, an attack on the total opposite side of the board. Like, it, it looks like black is trying to spice things up over here, but you leave this option open to attack the king at any moment that you like, and you go to the queen side. The point is that if you go to the queen side, and let's say black calls your bluff, d takes c4, after something like bishop c4, um, you know, queen f6. Uh, here, there is a really interesting variation that uh, I was watching Max Warmerdam. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that even slightly correctly. The Dutch, actually the Dutch champion, he just won the Dutch championships, uh, was talking with Giri and Polgar. There's a line here, rook e1, king f8, queen b3. But I mean, white is basically saying, okay, you have nothing to guard your queen side. And black says, I don't need anything to guard my, king, uh, my queen side. I mean, h4 is a ridiculous move. But I did just call it out. And the point of h4 is actually fascinating. First of all, you kind of anticipate this, but queen b7 is met with this stunning move, bishop c6. This is called tactical defense. Like a defense with a tactical purpose. You cannot uh, take the bishop because check, and then I win your queen, and now you can't take the rook. And if you have to come back, I then take this, and I mean, black's bishops are extremely strong. However, the other purpose of the move h4 is really, really deep. If white plays rook to e3 to try to play rook f3, there is rook to h5. There is rook to h5. And that's really my whole purpose of these recaps. Um, I want to share the ideas in a bite-sized, digestible, understandable content, but I also want to collect and crowdsource some of the analysis that I've seen over the hours of the game, which is one of the things that I like to do. When one of the streams goes on commercial break, I like to provide this for you. Yeah, Max Varmerdam and, um, and Ishgiri were talking about this uh, on, their, uh, on their commentary together. Fascinating variation that could have, you know, could have arisen after the move C4. Um, among other things, I mean, there are other things that can happen here. Black can just immediately play queen h4 and try to mate white. But that didn't happen, folks. I mean, I know I just talked about it for three, four minutes. I'm supposed to tell you what actually happened in the game, but the move c4 was critical. Instead of that, Magnus spent 40 minutes and 41 seconds, I believe, and played queen e1 check. And this is weird because if the rook gave the check, the king would have to go to f8 most likely. You don't want to block with the bishops because you kill your own mobility and you give the person a target. Just so you're clear if you're wondering why even blocking with the bishops is not being discussed. But here for the life of me, I do not understand why Jan did not just go for the queen trade. Nobody understood. Absolutely nobody understood Jan's decision uh, from, uh, on his next move. I mean, queen e7, just trade the damn queens. You know, make the draw with black, go to the res day. Now you go back to playing with the white pieces. Jan played king f8. Um, the point of queen e1 is to play bishop b4. It's to trade the powerful attacking bishop that black has created 
uh, and ultimately play on the queen side, like get the queen over there to pressure stuff. And the thing is, if you trade enough pieces and still have a little bit more activity than your opponent, their king is a little bit awkward. This pawn could potentially be a target, right? Like, so you have slight edge maybe in the position. So we have bishop b4. Now you see the problem. If you take, I'm going to take and I'm going to be hitting your king in this pawn. And the more pieces you trade, I will, I will win that pawn. So queen e7. We have bishop takes d6, uh, so that you have to take with the queen. You don't want to do this, just so you understand. This is a completely lost position for, for black. Structurally, this is just lost. I mean, like, it's it's horrible, terrible decision. So queen d6, and we have queen d2. So eyeballing this diagonal and maintaining the pressure there and opening up e1. Now, when I saw this position, I was eating breakfast uh, with Lucy. And I kind of said, like, this is going to be annoying for Jan, but he shouldn't lose this at all. And, um, well, we're going to watch how Magnus applies the pressure. Uh, you would just think, looking at this, I mean, how, how do you even, right? Because black is going to just go like this. I mean, black is going to play rookie eight. Just trade the pieces, make a draw, boys. And then I checked uh, a couple moves later, and they had already traded rooks. I was like, ah, oh, man, another boring draw. Maybe it won't be such a boring draw. Let's stay tuned. Let's see how Magnus applies the pressure. Rookie eight, rookie one. So what is white's advantage? White's advantage is black's bad king positioning, kind of making sure that the queen side can always be infiltrated and stuff can be attacked. Uh, and also potentially the fact that it's just a little, you know, black needs to be precise and not fall asleep at the wheel for two, three moves. The position that kind of uh, relies on, on um, Jan's imprecision potentially more than it does on Magnus's precision. So rookie one, Jan on this move spent, I think it said 20 seconds, if, if it was correct. Jan can play like maybe rook takes rook and g6 king g7, like g6 king g7, um, maybe rook takes rook first, but Jan played rook h6, like virtually instantly, and now he went from being uh, just on the verge of equalizing to giving Magnus some pressure again in the form of the move queen g5. Now Magnus could have also played rook takes rook and then played queen g5, he chose to do it in this move order. Um, and if you're wondering, like, for example, why, why, why would I take like this, right? And, and, and then, like, isn't queen g5 still very scary? The king is good on g7. I mean, the king is completely fine on g7. And y you can make a bunch of really aggressive looking moves, but black just is in time. I mean, like, black just, that's it. The game's a draw. I mean, it's just, it's just simply a draw. But queen g5 doesn't let you trade the rook on e8, so white is going to kind of permanently have a rook here. And I mean, if you're, if you're heading over here with the rook, maybe to e6, like this move prevents that. You cannot go to e6, if that was the idea, because queen h5. And if you play g6, not only do you block your rook, you also lose it. <laughs> so, and if you play queen f6, there's this. So for that reason, Jan plays c6, which visually looks like a logical move because now queen f6 is the idea we have takes takes rookie one and now you know the, the, the whole point uh becomes clear right like queen f6 right uh first um yeah uh, first uh first kind of maybe maybe very mild inaccuracy of magnuses throughout this entire game i mean this is like very very mild and if you plug it into engine it's it's like not even it doesn't even say that it's that mild but peep uh not not a big deal they're not saying that it's not mild people were saying queen g3 here is an interesting move. Um, queen g3 with the intention of just, just beelining to b8 and going after this bishop. Black here can take on d4 um, and, uh, and be just in time to cut off the rook. And, and here there's, there's this move, bishop f5, which I saw analyzed in some places. Bishop f5 is hilarious. And it's just, a, it's frozen. You, you cannot play rook e6, uh, that's d6, but you cannot play this. And I mean, I'm just threatening to, to come in. Black, uh, this, you can't stop this. For example, if you play g6 here, I can just go back. It's insane. I mean, this bishop is just, it's trash. It's so bad. For instance, c5 to try to break it out, but now white, white is just in there. I mean, it, it's, it's over. Like, this bishop f5 idea is absolutely fascinating. So if black tries to, like, dance, you know, dance here with the queen back and forth with queen d6, white can play rook e5 and get this very interesting position, like baiting f6 and queen f4. And I mean, black just like has no moves. You're, you're threatening rook e8, king e8, queen takes queen. So Magnus could have gone for this queen g3. He chooses to play queen e3, which is not a bad move at all. I mean, it threatens mate in one. How bad of a move can it be? Jan plays bishop d7. Magnus plays h3 so that he never gets back rank checkmated. Jan plays h4 because he wants these pawns to kiss. 
Um, and also that pawn is no longer a target, and maybe he has g5, g4 intentions in the future with king g7. Position is actually looking not so bad. Now, now Magnus plays c4. So again, we, we saw this move like 10 moves ago, he could have played c4. The point of c4 is to create just the slightest of imbalances after dc4, bishop c4. The bishop now has a different target. This pawn is isolated, but it's not really weak. Um, and you know, but the other thing that you do by moving the bishop to c4 is what? Who have you opened up? You've opened up the queen. The queen now has this access square to hit the king and the pawn, right? And um, Jan did not necessarily have to take on c4. He could have played g5, but it's, I mean, th this, is, this is still the idea. So how do you prevent queen a3? You could play something like queen to d6, which completely prevents the queen from going to a3. Queen d6 is not an unreasonable move. You could play a6, which allows queen a3, but at least doesn't hang the pawn, and you can also play king to g8. You also can play b5, right? Because now this check doesn't make much sense, because the king goes and the bishop is still hanging, so that, that, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Except b5 is a humongous blunder. And I was sitting live at my, board, at, 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 at my computer, actually, I was already back from breakfast, when this move was played. And b5 absolutely does not stop queen a3. Maybe he thought queen a3, queen d6, but then there is this. And it's absolutely shocking, but it's mate. I mean, it's simply mate if you take the bishop. It's mate. Because you never actually found any sort of safe haven for this king. You can allow all of this and hang the bishop and it's just mate. I mean, you have to lose your queen and your bishop. Back rank mate. Which is another crazy thing. He never moved his g-pawn. He never made this access point for his king to get out. And he removed his rook from the back rank, so now there's also no protection of the king were to move off the back rank. So b5, and oh my god, oh my god, Jan Nepomnici has blundered. Queen a3, he goes king g8, queen a7. Now, it's not a matter of back rank mate anymore, but it's a matter of if you take my bishop, I take your bishop. And this is a losing endgame because it's only a pawn down, but humongous pawn weaknesses and the past a pawn. So Magnus Carlsen can win this position, you know, if you're beating him with a stick the entire time. He's just like, it's like a slight inconvenience for him, and then he's just going to play all the best moves. I mean, this is just game over. The only practical chance that Jan has now is to give away his bishop. Like, okay, I'm going to take a bishop, so there's a desperado here for me, which is a, a, a tactic name where you sacrifice your piece just preemptively because you're going to get it back anyway. And now Magnus would play a desperado of his own to not lose the bishop for nothing, which is taking on f7. And we would get this endgame. And here, I mean, there's a completely ludicrous variation which goes like this, where it looks like black can stabilize, but because your pawn is such a weakness, white's position works perfectly, there is a fascinating variation here where black doesn't even try to defend the pawn, but goes like this and tries to go after a2. Uh, that's, that's probably just lost. Two pawns down with just a vague counterplay on the outside pawn, but this is the practical best chance, and Jan just cannot bring himself to do this, and instead goes back to d8. The problem with this is that even though it's a one pawn advantage, it is plus six according to the computer. And if you've made it 18 minutes into this recap, I think you know where we're going here. You give Magnus plus six, it's probably going to be bad news. And because Jan now sees the problem of that, you know, white is just going to gang up on the rest of the weaknesses because five of white's pawns are almost on their home squares. Two of Jan's pawns are there, right? So that's the problem. White, because he never overextended the pawns, never has to worry about weaknesses. And this is hardly a weakness. This is a weakness. That square is a nice transfer point. F7 is weak. So Jan goes for a queen and pawn endgame. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here. I will just show you how he cleans it up because there are now three weaknesses to go for. All Magnus has to be careful about here is getting caught in a perpetual check. That is how you win one of these endgames. You keep that material advantage. Queen a5, you clean it up. That's not a perpetual check. Check. Take with check. Always make sure you're checking so you don't get caught in some sort of box. And now he gives another check and he plays b3. Why? Because if you take on a2, I have this. I win this pawn. It's now 4 to 2. And by the way, if you've wondered why Jan hasn't resigned yet, um, and I mean, this game lasted a short while longer, uh, it's because you, you honestly sometimes just need to like get, get it off. I mean, you just, Magnus will not blunder a draw. You should never resign in this position. Play it out until the very end. Um, Magnus will not blunder a draw, but there is, you know, this kind of vague possibility. But at the same time, it's like you need that time to blow off the steam. 
but you know um yeah so queen e5 cuts off any sort of checks and now magnus uh finds a spot where the box of checks is kind of stopped and uh he gets the optimal position. There is nothing on the back rank now. He will push his pawns forward. The B pawn will be the decoy for the queen for the D pawn to get through. Jan, one last ditch effort, sacking the pawns to try to get perpetual check. And Magnus plays queen f3. Very, very, very clean move, uh, which ultimately would just result in just a three pawn up endgame. And um, after queen f3, Jan finally threw in the towel and resigned. Magnus Carlsen takes a 5-3 lead in the World Chess Championship. There are six games remaining. Tomorrow there is a rest day. Y uh, Jan now needs four and a half out of six. He needs four out of six to tie the match. He needs four and a half out of six to win it, but he needs four points out of six to tie the match. Uh, is the match over? Most likely. That is the unfortunate reality, and a couple of narratives are now coming true, namely the fact that before the match, Magnus and others did say that Jan can sometimes be prone to collapse uh, if, you, if he is pressured and if he has one setback. And I really hate that that is coming true. I mean, I really, really, really hate that. And I, you know, my, my, I'm gutted. And I mean, my heart is broken. And this, you never want to lose a game like this. You want to lose a game like in game six in some ways. But you never want to lose a game like this, you know? Uh, B5, Queen A3, a one mover. And um, if you want to watch some of the broadcasts back, whether it's Geary, I mean, whether it's chess.com or whatever website you're catching it on, today was a, was a rough day. I mean, the commentary was pretty critical of Jan. And I, I always feel a bit silly, like, like saying, like, you know, critical, very critical things about the players because I am nowhere near their level, 400 points, 500 points, ELO, less. But when Fabiano and Geary are saying certain things, it's like, wow, you know, they make a fair point. Um, Fabiano was saying things like, uh, it's not good optics, for example, sometimes, like, Magnus is the only one sitting at the board, so, yeah, it was rough today, the commentary was rough, and it's a shame this narrative is sort of, kind of, molding itself to be true, but that does not take away from the menace, the absolute menace that Magnus Carlsen is to play against, this man has a two-game lead, he's now won two out of his last two games with the white pieces, today, good preparation paying off, um, and uh, yeah, it's five to three. And tomorrow we have a rest day. I'm going to go celebrate my birthday. I know one person who will not be celebrating today, but I uh, will see you all for game number nine, 10. And I'm not sure we're making it to 14, but hopefully we do. Thank you all again for all of your support, both on uh, we, uh, giving me the well wishes today and uh, through all your support on the recaps. And I will see you in the next one. Get out of here.